Good day, everyone. Joe Giannato here of World Instructor Training Schools. And today we're going to be going over sleep deprivation, both detriments and dangers, uh, as well as to address you know, sleep deprivation, which is a chronic and pervasive issue, uh, not just for our clients, but across society and how we can go ahead and remediate that. So we will be um, starting momentarily, just going to give folks um, you know, a few moments to get situated, you know, have a healthy uh, beverage handy, uh, perhaps even a healthy snack, um, getting themselves comfortable for the next hour or so. Uh, buckle up because we're going to learn a lot. We're going to have the opportunity uh, to have a brief discussion afterwards. And of course, all of this information uh, that we're going to be sharing will be available to you via a recording. In addition to that, too, if you haven't done so already, um, you know, I advise you to go ahead and just scan the QR code on the lower right hand corner, uh, which you can view my article that was published earlier this month. Uh, a lot of content is going to be gleaned from that article um, that's going to be discussed during today's webinar. So it's definitely helpful to maybe, you know, do some of that reading or it would have been helpful to do some of that reading in advance. But if you haven't done so already, that's fine because we're going to be covering all of the salient points as it relates to sleep deprivation. And we're also going to take a deep dive into sleep science and how sleep is beneficial uh, from a health perspective and also from a performance context. So we will be starting momentarily, just gonna give everyone about another minute or so um, you know, to get situated. We have folks that are logging in. Uh, certainly uh, you're more than welcome to go ahead and chat in, uh, you know, question either myself or our president and CEO, Jay Del Vecchio, who is a, um, yeah. a close friend and a close colleague, and he's gonna be uh, you know, manning the keyboard um and moderating you know any questions that come on through um if you are not on mute please uh you know mute yourself to drown out any ambient noise uh that that you may have um wish i could do that all the time you know with, with kids around um but you know here i am uh today and here you are today we're going to be discussing sleep deprivation detriments and dangers beautiful beautiful joe i'm, I'm thrilled to have you on here with us we had a High registration with it. And again, I'll remind everybody that six hours after this uh, uh, this broadcast ends, you will get your recording um, and, of course, uh, your quiz for the CEC to complete by Monday by 5 p.m. With, of course, um, you passing with eight out of ten questions being correct. So. Uh, have fun with it. If you haven't been on our new website, uh, we are still adding and tweaking a few things, but you will be able to build out a portal. So check your newsletter. I'm going to do a little thing on how to build out your portal and have your all of your uh, past CECs um, in there so you can check them anytime as to what you did, what you didn't, reflections on uh, being able to get access to them if you wanted to review something, including this fantastic uh, presentation that's about to go on by uh, by Joe. So thank you for coming, and uh, I will be here for questions on the side, reading the panel, guys. But you know what? You got the freedom of being able to unmute and asking the questions, so Joe can really expand on on insights for you of that article, which I'm sure you guys have read. So um, thanks, and um, Joe didn't mean to hold you up, but I wanted to get rid of that little thanks. admin part of it. <laughs> Take over, my yeah, friend. Please. As always, thank you so much for the support of the opportunity. Um, and also, you know, thanks for everyone's, you know, time today um, and, you know, everyone's, you know, willingness, but really more over motivation, intrinsic motivation to learn, uh, to add some tools um, to your toolbox and to sharpen existing ones. Um, this is something that is, you know, really going to impact every facet of your life, as you soon see. Uh, today's objective, we will be learning about the effects of sleep deprivation, how technology, stress, and illness can impact sleep. We're also going to be examining the stages of sleep and associated physiological processes and reviewing recommendations on how to improve sleep. Uh, so this is going to have um, implications for yourselves as well as clients, maybe perhaps athletes you know, across a continuum of population. So we're gonna be touching on that. We're also going to be, um, you know, expanding upon sleep quality, uh, which is one of the overlooked aspects of sleep because we technically think in terms of duration, hey, you slept eight hours, but those eight hours, we might have not gotten any deep sleep or, 
you know, even deeper sleep or REM sleep. So we'll be discussing what REM sleep constitutes and why it is so, you know, coveted. Some learning outcomes associated with this webinar uh, will be explicating the role of sleep, physiologic processes associated with each stage of sleep, and how sleep is linked inextricably to health and performance. We're also going to have a better understanding of how technology, stress, and illness can adversely impact sleep. So, you know, having screen time right before bed or, you know, having a phone nearby, um, you know, on your nightstand or sometimes even in bed with you could potentially be a fire hazard if you had an old Android phone. Um, you know, there are some detriments um, to sleep and it could potentially lead to some sleep latency issues. We'll see why um, in a few short moments. And also being able to adopt and providing recommendations related to improving sleep quality. So a little bit about myself. I've been um, affiliated with the World Instructor Training School since 2010. So a proud member of the Witz family um, where I continue to uh, teach a number of virtual as well as um, in-person uh, labs and also lectures. Um, I've taught you know, no lie, maybe dozens. I, I, I've really lost count. Um, but, you know, for me, that was really an opportunity uh, to impart some of my experiences, um, you know, some of my anecdotes, you know, certainly drawing you know, from my breadth of experiences, which you see here, um, you know, and helping, you know, maybe shape or influence, maybe even motivate perhaps, you know, provide, you know, some folks, you know, stories of my transgressions earlier in my career, even presently, uh, to improve, you know, their careers, to improve, you know, their lives and the lives of other people. Um, you know, presently, I am uh, in the process of completing uh, a PhD program in exercise and sports science, maintain multiple adjunct faculty appointments um, in conjunction with my full-time job where I support University of Virginia's award-winning employee well-being program, who's well, um, and I have a very diverse experience uh, within the uh, health and wellness and fitness sectors. Uh, but for me, this is something that I love. It's a labor of love. And, you know, I'm really, you know, a teacher at heart. So, um, you know, hopefully we're able to learn together over the next, um, you know, 45, 50 minutes or so. And I'm always learning from you all. And that's one of the reasons that I love to teach, um, just because, you know, I learn so much from webinar attendees, from other colleagues that, you know, I might be presenting with. Or collaborating with and, and of course you know the the number of students that i have in my classes you know there might be an age gap they may not have as much experience but certainly they have perspectives that are very valuable and uh, are, are certainly you know worth um you know consideration especially if it's going to be beneficial um you know to people's lives they might be seeing things from a different lens versus myself so the itinerary for today we're going to be explicating what sleep is OK, um, you know, it's a little bit more complex, uh, a little bit more nuanced than your head really hitting a pillow. How awesome would that be if your head hits the pillow and you're out and you get your eight, nine hours or however many hours of sleep that you need, depending upon your age, depending upon your activity level, um, depending upon, you know, your health conditions or goals. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Also learning about the role of sleep. OK, um, you know, so sleep is really restorative in nature. We're going to see how it restores multiple physiological functions. We're also going to be reviewing the stages of sleep and associated physiological processes with most of those stages. And then, of course, we're going to turn our attention to sleep deprivation and how sleep deprivation is so detrimental uh, to health. And it's a pervasive you know, issue. Um, not only for many of our clients and athletes, but it's also, you know, pervasive um, in society and something that I would consider to be an epidemic because we as a society are sleep deprived. And how the impact of sleep deprivation um, or the impact that it has on health and performance. Also, we're going to be concluding with how technology, stress and illness interfere with sleep. It's more of a vicious cycle, especially when we look at illness and sleep in those contexts and then reviewing some sleep recommendations. So if you haven't done so already, I advise all of you guys, we're going to take a break, 15 minutes, cat nap. No, just kidding. We are going to be discussing the applicability of naps uh, during our webinar um, because naps are very important. But I do want to caution you that naps are not a way uh, to address sleep hygiene or maybe a lack of um, you know, sleep in terms of you know, if an individual has a, a sleep deficit, which is cumulative. Uh, so we're going to be talking about that shortly. So what exactly is sleep? Well, sleep is a reversible state in which a person is perceptually and physically disengaged 
from and unresponsive to the surrounding environment. So in a way, you're unconscious. You know, in a way, um, you know, you are not alert or awake, although um, in your initial stages of sleep, particularly when we look at uh, stage one, also known as N1, you know, there, there are going to be, you know, alterations in, you know, sleep and wake or alert, um, you know, states, um, especially as you are drifting off. There, there might be, you know, um, you know, some, you know, hypnotic jerks or myoclonus where there's, you know, some muscle twitching or sort of restless leg syndrome. Um, so some of these things are realized or some of these things are experienced as you, you know, fade in or as you drift into a deeper sleep. So sleep is governed by an organelle which is located within the hypothalamus. It is known as the suprachiasmatic nucleus or SCN. More on that a little bit later and how light impacts the SCN's function, especially exposure to bright light. Now, sleep is also going to be influenced by Y-aminobutyric acid, also known as GABA, which is secreted in the anterior hypothalamus, so nearby uh, the super uh, chiasmatic nucleus, and also adenosine, which is secreted by the anterior pituitary gland. Now, let's talk about adenosine for a little while, for a little bit. Who here has ever experienced, you know, fatigue during the course of the day, or maybe late at night, uh, maybe early in the morning, I mean, I only slept four or five hours, maybe I slept, um, you know, not at all, and, and I really need to wake up, I need a jolt. Well, adenosine is the inhibitory transmitter, um, neurotransmitter, very similar to GABA, but adenosine actually causes fatigue, causes tiredness. And what happens is, you know, adenosine will interact with these adenosine receptors in multiple cells. We talked about it being an inhibitory, um, you know, neurotransmitter. So it's quite the opposite of acetylcholine and also other neurotransmitters that will lead to, you know, um, neuro excitability. So for instance, you know, you need to have the transmitter acetylcholine to, you know, stimulate muscle contraction. We're not going to be discussing muscular contraction too much in today's webinar, uh, but just want to illustrate that adenosine, similar to, you know, GABA, as I mentioned before, really kind of make the body tired. So adenosine interacts with those adenosine receptors, you know, in multiple cells, um, and it's, you know, going to lead to um, you know, fatigue, it's going to lead to some tiredness. So people will consume caffeinated beverages, tea and coffee, which are, uh, you know, respectively, the second and third most consumed beverages in the world after water uh, to block um, or really to block those adenosine receptors, or they're also known as, you know, uh, adenosine receptor antagonists, anything that's caffeinated, anything that's considered, um, you know, caffeine or metabolite, which is you know, uh, in the xanthine class of alkaloids, which you don't need to worry about, okay? So we're going far too deep into neurochemistry. Um, now, wakefulness is gonna be governed by neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, and also histamine. Um, if we talk about histamine, usually that's associated with some sort of, you know, inflammatory response, uh, but here, you know, it's to, you know, stimulate, you know, some wakefulness. Uh, usually, that's these hormones are going to increase, um, you know, as you transition out of sleep, once you've received a sufficient amount of sleep, um, you know, and that's really governed, you know, by your circadian rhythm, and it's also governed by your environment. And we'll talk about some of those environmental implications on sleep shortly. So sleep, it enhances neurocognitive functioning. So who here has ever, you know, slept you know, maybe two or three hours or not at all, you know, the night prior to an exam, the night prior to a big presentation, maybe perhaps, you know, negotiation at work, or maybe perhaps dealing with a full slate of clients, you know, you're dragging, you know, you're not really, you know, thinking, you know, clearly on your feet. Um, you know, you might not be able to be, you know, an extemporaneous, you know, speaker where, you know, again, you could just go ahead and, you know, blurt out things on the fly. Probably not going to be the best litigator if you're a trial attorney. Uh, probably not going to be the best neurosurgeon, you know, if you're cracking open someone's cranium and performing some, uh, you know, surgical procedure. Um, so you need neurocognition in order to uh, function at a high level. It also streamlines metabolic processes and influences the secretion of hormones, which modulate appetite and also satiation, so fullness. Now, if you are tired, if you are sleep deprived, you're going to be a little more hungry because now, you know, you need more 
energy. So folks will maybe rely on, you know, some of those um, androgen receptor antagonists such as, you know, caffeine, um, you know, tea or, or, you know, more popularly here in the United States, more broadly North America, coffee, um, maybe relying on, you know, higher carbohydrate, um, you know, containing foods um, and snacks just to kind of offset that fatigue. Sleep also bolsters immunological functioning too. So individuals that are sleep deprived are gonna be at a greater risk of you know, contracting viruses and bacteria and also at a greater risk of upper respiratory tract infections, which are common among endurance athletes and also endurance athletes during colder times of the year. And sleep provides an environment that is conducive to the production and dispersal of sex hormones and also of growth factors. So this is going to help with, you know, uh, fertility. It's also going to help with the ability to add and maintain lean body mass. It's also going to be conducive to your recoverability. Um, so all very important, especially, you know, if, you know, you are, you know, exercising, you know, vigorously, you know, because exercise by itself, when we look at a singular, um, you know, exercise session, when we look at a workout, when we look at any sort of bout of physical activity where exertion is increased, it's very catabolic in nature. Exercise breaks the body down. The adaptation to that is making the body stronger. We're, talk we're talking in broad terms here, but improving the strength or improving the capacity, improving the health of multiple physiological systems. Um, so that's a long, longer term adaptation to exercise, but that's going to be delayed if we're not receiving a sufficient amount of sleep because we're not able to recover between sessions, between workouts. So sleep consists of two distinct states, both with differing physiological and behavioral properties. We have non-rapid eye movement sleep, or NREM, also known as N, and this is comprised of four stages of sleep. So we have N1 all the way on through N4. Now, in non-rapid eye movement sleep, brain waves become progressively synchronous. Um, you know, they actually will slow down um, to below, uh, you know, your brain activity while awake. Um, now we transition into rapid eye movement sleep, which accounts for 25% of sleep, or roughly two hours of sleep if you're receiving eight hours a night. Um, and it's during this phase where there's going to be an inhibited secretion of some of those neurotransmitters. So if we were to go back a few slides, we have acetylcholine, we have uh, dopamine, we have serotonin, we also have histamine. It's reducing those because they are involved in waking the body up. We also have uh, muscle atonia and it's during REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep where individuals are now experiencing dreams and they're able to recall those dreams the next day because those dreams are a little bit more lucid. And, you know, again, this might be a little anecdotal um, and you could look at, you know, some, you know, survey, um, you know, data within the literature, but individuals who are able to recall their dreams from the night before um, are often better rested. Um, but again, it's rather inconclusive in terms of, you know, dreams correlating with sleep quality, which correlates with, you know, next day or subsequent day performance um, on a multitude of tasks. Could be an interesting research topic, kind of lives outside of my dissertation topic, but I digress. So REM sleep is vitally important. REM sleep is, you know, um, kind of the destination at the end of the Yellow Brook Road, or it's the um, proverbial pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It is really the goal of anyone that is, you know, sleeping to experience REM sleep because REM sleep is going to be necessary for neurodevelopment. So we look at hippocampal cortical biogenesis. And what does that mean? So, for instance, who here is studying for an exam? Could be, you know, the WITS um, certified personal trainer exam. Could be, you know, maybe another, you know, exam. Maybe it's associated with an undergraduate course or graduate course. Um, whatever the case may be you need to make sure that you're able to memorize the content that is gonna be required for said exam. Now that is done during a process known as memory consolidation, where memories, these kind of uh, transitory or late memories uh, are you know, stored within the hippocampus. And then from the hippocampus, they are consolidated 
now transfer to, for really lack of better words, I think they call it translocation, um, into the neocortex, where it is kind of inscripted within that tissue. Um, in addition to that too, motor learning works similarly. So if you're looking to improve upon a motor related task, if you golf, if you play baseball, um, you know, if you play pickleball, wh whatever the sport may be, if you're trying to, um, you know, streamline a test that's associated with that sport, you're gonna need to make sure that you're establishing motor engrams. And what that means is practice becoming perfect. But the only way that practice is gonna become near perfect is if we're, you know, getting a sufficient amount of sleep, because now we have essentially motor learning memories or motor memories that are now being inscripted um you know into the hippocampus and then finally you know we're looking at that you know kind of being imprinted um you know within the neocortex then we also look at emotional processing um and rem sleeping or rem sleep as i mentioned before um you know is correlative with dreaming now rem sleep is correlative with your cognitive function mental health and emotional well-being and also um you know the risk of major depressive disorder bipolar disorder uh post-traumatic stress disorder so if we're looking to allay some of the incidences or even you know this or temper the severity of those conditions um you know either as an adjunct um or you know maybe as a standalone perhaps um you know we want to make sure that we're getting a sufficient amount of sleep so that way we're able to get rem sleep now rem sleep is characterized by irregular uh, muscle activation patterns and one of the reasons it's irregular is because some of those neurotransmitters are now suppressed during rem sleep um and there's also going to be you know a fluctuation in some of those inhibitory neurotransmitters we talked about gaba we also talked about adenosine but not to the point where you're going to be fatigued if you're in REM sleep, but it's going to keep you in REM sleep. Uh, also, rapid movements of the eyes, which is a hallmark of REM sleep. That's why we call it rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. Um, there's also going to be increased blood oxygen levels and also increased blood, uh, brain metabolism because there's greater brain activity associated with REM sleep. Any questions uh, thus far before we proceed on to additional content? We still have some folks that are logging in, which is great. So the road to REM continues. So right now we're awake, we're maybe alert. You know, if, if I'm in a meeting sometimes, I might not be alert, I'm just, you know, full disclosure, uh, but we are not sleeping. Hopefully we're not. If we are, you know, um, hopefully we're on the road to REM. Now, we're gonna go from that state of alertness or wakefulness into uh, stage one or N1. And this is really gonna be the first, you know, few minutes of sleep. Um, and this is where we're going to have alpha and beta brain waves that are going to be emitted. And, you know, the brain waves are analyzed through, um, you know, a, um, through, you know, uh, electroencephalopathy. So EEG, you know, scans. And over the course of time, these brain waves are going to become slower and slower um, throughout the different stages of sleep. Usually during this, um, you know, stage of sleep, you might be, um, you know, hallucinating. These are actually uh, hallucinations just due to a lot of the increased you know, neurotransmitter activity, uh, hypnagogic, you know, hallucinations where you don't know where you are, or you might be fading in and out of sleep, and you think someone said something to you, no one's around, or they didn't say anything to you because they were asleep. Um, your respiration rate is typically going to be similar to your, um, you know, your wake state. We get into stage two sleep. This is where, you know, brain waves are, you know, going to fluctuate a little bit more. Uh, your body temperature will lower and your sympathetic nervous system activity, and more on that in a short moment, um, you know, is reduced. Now, this is typically the stage where memory consolidation is initiated. And this is also where bruxism is um, experienced. So if you're grinding you know, your teeth at night, you wake up middle of the night, really sore or the next morning they're really sore your jaws are sore your teeth hurt um, this is typically where bruxism is going to transpire we get into the third stage um, you know which is rather transitory um, before it's going to shift you into the deeper um, you know sleep stages of stage four and then lastly stage five where now we're at REM sleep uh, which is characterized by an increase in brain activity uh, and fluctuations in you know neurotransmission um, during that stage, okay? Stage three is gonna be most conducive to recovery because this is where we're gonna see, you know, an increase um, in 
endogenous hormone secretion, so testosterone, growth hormone, erythropoiesis, which, you know, or EPO that lends itself uh, to a process um, that will, you know, help produce red blood cells. And you have more red blood cells, you have more hemoglobin, you have more hemoglobin, you have more ability to uh, force oxygenated blood to working musculature. So very helpful there to tissue regeneration, immune system support. Um, if you sleepwalk or maybe if you're a child, you left the bed at some point or you're experiencing night terrors, um, you know, this is really the stage where all that transpires, unfortunately. Uh, but for most people, you know, this is just really going to be a beneficial stage because this is where the body's going to be in a recovery mode. Um, so this is more of a physical recovery mode. And then, you know, with stage five, you know, REM sleep, it's going to be more of a um, neurophysiological or kind of brain recovery area, if you will. And here we see, you know, those um, sleep waves by EEG analysis. Um, so we're looking at, you know, some of these changes. We get into REM sleep. We see, um, you know, I guess less of a fluctuation. They're more rapid. There's a greater frequency. Um, there's less amplitude. So, you know, we see, you know, more, you know, marks. And we see that the brain activity is very similar to being awake. Um, you know, which is rather interesting. So let's discuss the topic at hand. What is sleep deprivation? So sleep deprivation, according to Chung and Ainsley, is characterized by a disruption in sleep, which may encompass a complete absence of normal sleep at normal times or abnormally long periods of wakefulness. So any sort of disruption, any sort of aberration you know, in one's uh, sleep can lead to some sleep deprivation. So for instance, if you've ever had a newborn that you're caring for at home, or perhaps, you know, if you're a shift worker, um, or, you know, maybe you've consumed, um, you know, some alcohol the night prior, uh, all of these can actually lead to, you know, some form of sleep deprivation or the causes of sleep deprivation. Same thing, with illness or you know um, psychological stress, all of these can lead to sleep deprivation. So sleep deprivation has been identified as a risk factor for developing cardiovascular metabolic disease over time. Now it's also going to suppress the immune system. And what some studies have found is that being sleep deprived just one night, and again, you know, sleep deprivation is going to vary from person to person how well it's tolerated, how much sleep an individual needs, and we'll talk about that in a second, um, is really highly individual. But if you are in a sleep deprived state, let's say if you sleep on average seven hours a night, but now you sleep five hours, um, or you ordinarily sleep maybe six or six hours a night, uh, now you're sleeping two or three hours. Um, when you are sleep deprived, that's actually going to increase your cancer risk acutely. Um, so that's something, again, that hasn't really been studied long term, uh, but certainly it can increase your cancer risk as there have been uh, a lot of reports uh, from individuals that are cancer patients that they, you know, were sleep deprived, that they've experienced you know, losses in sleep earlier in their lifespan or even preceding that diagnosis. Um, now, as it relates to, um, you know, varying amounts of sleep, and we'll talk about that. So some individuals are short sleepers. We look at, you know, uh, the designer Tom Ford. We look at, you know, former presidents Donald Trump and Barack Obama. Not politicizing this, but they are considered short sleepers. Elon Musk, another short sleeper. So what exactly is a short sleeper? A short sleeper is someone that has the presence of the DEC2 endogenous ligand or gene, um, which essentially kind of regulates sleep and regulates the SEN and also manipulates all of those uh, transmitters, whether they are um, you know, transmitters that are excitatory or there are some of those inhibitory transmitters such as GABA or adenosine, which lead to fatigue. Um, so they might bind with the, you know, the adenosine receptors. But DEC2 uh, will enable some folks to sleep fewer hours and still feel refreshed in the morning. There have been reports that Tom Ford only slept about two to four hours a night. Barack Obama sleeping about five to six hours a night. And this was prior to, you know, his presidency. So you could still function at a relatively high level. You know, if you are, you know, a 
you know, fashion design mogul or, you know, you're an executive or president of the United States, you know, requires you to function at a high level, but they were able to get away with it because they're short sleepers. Um, that's not to say that everyone is a short sleeper. I looked at some of the data. I think it's maybe only about two to three percent of the population is considered a short sleeper. Uh, but for the mere mortals, um, you know, we're going to require a little bit more sleep. Another short sleeper uh, was the late great Kobe Bryant who, you know, reportedly slept three to four hours a night. So that way he could, you know, practice um, three to four times a day for two to four hours each time. So maybe he was habituated to it. Uh, maybe it was some sort of intrinsic drive, but I highly speculate that he was a, a short sleeper also. So if we are sleep deprived, it's gonna increase our cancer risk. It's also gonna increase our systemic inflammation. It's gonna diminish fertility because again, that third stage of sleep is going to be shortened. Um, that's going to be affected. And, you know, we're not going to get as much endogenous, um, you know, sex hormone production, uh, such as testosterone or estrogen. There's also poor outcomes for populations with cardiometabolic disease or immune disorders. Um, just because, again, there's going to be more of that vicious cycle, less, um, you know, restorative periods. And then also, um, you know, the immune system is going to be impacted because we're not getting a sufficient amount of sleep. Then there's going to be a reduction in deep and more specifically REM sleep. So you're going to kind of be in a fog all the time. So some of the effects of sleep deprivation are looking like the woman in the cartoon image to the right. Um, you know, messy hair, unkempt, bags under the eyes. Looks like she might be sweating. I don't know. But we could usually tell when someone is sleep deprived. Um, if they're chronically sleep deprived, especially, or maybe they had a you know rough night of no sleep, um, you know the the night prior. So sleep uh, deprivation, it's been identified as a risk factor for developing cardiovascular metabolic disease. It is immunosuppressive, as we talked about this before. Diminishes fertility. We talked about the poor outcomes. Um, sleep deprivation negatively impacts mood, emotion, and emotional regulation. So you might be a little short, you might be curt, you might be whatever short or fused because hey, I didn't sleep, I'm grouchy. Um, also reduced times to exhaustion. Um, there's also an increased perceived exertion. So if you're working with a client first thing in the morning, maybe it's you know one of the initial sessions. And they're getting situated. Hey, I'm going to go work out at the gym before you know I go to work. Um, you know later on in the day, they might be tired because they're not yet accustomed to um, you know waking up that early. And maybe they sacrifice some of their sleep to meet with you early in the morning. Um, we're going to talk about some training considerations for these individuals and field any questions you all have. There's also decreased focus and vigor. There's also, you know, compromised recoverability from exercise and an increased injury risk. In addition to that, too, uh, what has also been noticed in, uh, in the literature is a decrease in reaction time and also uh, an increase in suicidal ideation. Uh, just because people will think rationally, you know, if they're sleep deprived, especially if they have some, you know, underlying mental health issues. What are some causes of sleep deprivation? Some causes include psychological stress. Everyone's been under, you know, an inordinate amount of stress recently, perhaps even the past, you know, uh, three to four years, um, you know, with COVID and, and some of the legislative, um, you know, issues. I mean, it's really been a, a challenging time, you know, in, in our country and certainly in our society. And then, of course, you know, a lot of these stresses are going to be compounded by family stress, occupational stress, whatever it may be, we're, we're all carrying, you know, some degree of stress with us that's going to impact, you know, um, our sleep or, or cause sleep deprivation. because We might be thinking about it or ruminating about it late at night or early in the morning. Uh, physiological stress is also a cause for sleep deprivation. So individuals that, you know, are acutely ill uh, may have had, um, you know, a very intense um, training session you know, that's going to heighten circulating glucocorticoids. It's going to elevate, you know, sympathetic nervous system activity, um, epinephrine. Uh, that, too, is going to, you know, lead to um, some sleep deprivation. We're going to have some sleep latency issues. It's going to be harder for them to get to sleep. Um, if you have a heightened sympathetic nervous system or you have, um, you know, greater sympathetic nervous system activity, higher heart rate, higher blood pressure, um, you know, higher body temperature, a lot of that's going to be associated with, um, you know, responses to physical activity, intense physical activity, um, that's going to, you know, delay your sleep or potentially interfere with your sleep. Also, we, if we have regular use 
uh, abuse, uh, recent or acute use or cessation of alcohol, drugs, or central nervous system stimulants, that too will lead to some sleep deprivation. Um, I, I'm not, you know, an advocate, again, I'm not a physician, but I'm not an advocate of, you know, having a glass of wine, you know, before, uh, before bedtime or, you know, any alcohol for that matter, because that could, you know, cause um, some circadian rhythm um, disruptions and also acutely affect, um, you know, your sleep quality and sleep duration, leading to sleep deprivation. Uh, looking at travel, meals, and food consumption before bedtime, okay? Uh, so these are also some considerations because we still have to digest um, you know, that food. And we also want to make sure that we avoid uh, any foods that um, contain a lot of carbohydrates or that are sugary, because they're going to evoke a greater insulinic response. The more insulin we produce, um, you know, the more metabolic activity there is. Also, there's going to be a, a greater, um, you know, increase in, in our, you know, uh, blood glucose levels, uh, which is going to lend itself to, you know, producing energy. And we don't want a lot of energy, especially as we try to, um, you know, fall asleep at night. Now, this is something that has been, um, you know, a rather hot topic, at least over the past 10 or 15 years, with a proliferation of nanotechnology. So we're looking at, you know, smartphones, other handheld devices, um, is exposure to uh, blue light. So the screen that you're looking at, unless you have a filter on it, um, is going to emit blue light. Or if you look at light emitting diodes, which are, you know, higher, um, you know, energy efficient, um, you know, greater lumens or brightness, um, you know, versions of, you know, typical, you know, white lights, or we're looking at fluorescent light. All of those can impact sleep uh, because they will, um, you know, they will interact with the pineal gland secretion of melatonin. Now, melatonin is, you know, you see it as uh, you know, supplement that's taken over the counter, but it's also a hormone, um, you know, which is a signaling hormone, which hormones are, that is going to help you fall asleep. Um, also, when we're exposed to blue light, that's gonna activate uh, something known as uh, intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, um, and they are gonna alter your circadian rhythm, and they're also gonna have direct projections on the SCN, which we mentioned before, and that's going to lead to some sleep disruptions um, because I, as I've we all know, some. sleep is covered by the SCN. I, I hear, uh, does somebody have a question? Yeah, Joe, I, I, yeah. Uh, Darnell had written, um, do you agree that eating protein right before bed helps in sleep? Well, it's, it's twofold. So number one, it's not going to evoke that insulinic response that carbohydrates will. So carbohydrates usually have a surge of energy, which because you have a higher blood glucose, at least acutely before that the, the glucose in your blood can now be shuttled, you know, to muscles to replenish, you know, muscle glycogen stores, or maybe even, um, you know, eventually metabolized and broken down, you know, as, as fat, especially if it's in excess. Um, with protein, it's going to be slower digesting. It's also going to help you um, you know, stabilize your blood sugar levels. It's not going to evoke that profound response where your body's going to be secreting a lot of insulin. So a lot of folks will advocate, you know, and, and a lot of experts have advocated, you know, consuming protein, you know, prior to, uh, you know, retiring for the bed, uh, bed, uh, bedtime, um, you know, prior to sleeping six to eight hours. So that way your body's in somewhat of a fed or, or anabolic state. They also recommend instead of whey protein, maybe casein protein, uh, which digests a little bit more slowly. Um, but I, I think protein would be, a, you know, a preferred choice over, you know, carbohydrates before bed. And just say if you're pressed into it, you may be a shift worker. You may have a busy travel schedule. You may have a, a busy uh, work day. My recommendation would be, you know, let's go ahead. We're going to have, you know, some protein with a little bit of, you know, unsaturated fats, um, you know, before bed. And I mentioned unsaturated fats because that's going to lead to satiation. So you're not going to be in a, in this kind of like feeding frenzy before bed, like, hey, I'm so hungry, I need to get a meal. Um, but, you know, if we're judiciously selecting, you know, um, some good fats along with a good protein source, a lean protein source, um, that's going to set up stuff nicely. For individuals that are maybe training late at night, uh, that are going to, that have to go to bed because they maintain maybe a first shift schedule, nine to five, et cetera, um, I would probably go with you know a, a protein supplement, um, you know, which is going to be very beneficial, um, you know, prior to bed. A well, great question, Darnell. 
Nice. So, right, light before bed, bad. Big meals before bed, especially sugary and, and uh, you know, higher carbohydrate meals, also bad. Um, you know, partying, bad exposure to light. You know, you don't want to be in Times Square and then, you know, uh, just say, hey, I'm going to go to a hotel and, and go to bed. It's not going to work that way, you know, for a lot of folks. And that's, and that's not even considering, you know, some of the ambient noise, too. So those are some of the causes of sleep deprivation. Now we're going to go on to some of the recommendations. OK. So according to the National Sleep Foundation, um, you know, and, and a lot of other bodies, you know, they tend to focus, you know, their efforts or they tend to shift their emphasis to sleep duration and not quality. Um, so we're going to we're going to still provide an overview of duration. So durations for those across the lifespan are as follows. So newborns, 16, 18 hours per day. Uh, we're talking about newborn humans because adult dogs and adult cats can sleep up to 20 to 22 hours a day. Um, but we're talking about, you know, humans here. And what's interesting is, uh, you know, newborns and infants, um, you know, nearly half of their sleep throughout the course of the day, which includes naps, um, if you have a cooperative kid, um, is constituted of REM sleep because REM sleep is vitally important when we reviewed this earlier in neurogeneration and we looked at you know the the hippocampal and the neocortical biogenesis so it's actually helping with you know hyperplasia of brain cells your brain is actively growing uh during that time um you know so that way you're able to you know consolidate memories you're able to learn things you know uh through play through interaction um, most of your learning throughout the lifespan transpires uh, between age zero and three. For preschool age children up to the age of five, 11 to 12 hours per day, there might be a nap in there too. School age children, 10 hours per night. Teenagers, you know, should be sleeping up to 10 hours per night, but usually burning the candle on both ends because middle school or junior high and also high school uh, typically begin a little bit earlier and usually they're night owls. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, hormonal fluctuations, um, you know, which lead to, uh, you know, sleep latency issues. Um, and then, of course, that's going to be exacerbated by technology. Adults, seven to eight hours per night. Um, although, again, for individuals that are short sleepers, could be lower. Um, you know, anything significantly more than eight hours per night. If you're, if you're not, if it's not restful sleep for you, you may have some sleep quality issues. But we'll talk about how we can... Um, you know, improve sleep quality, you know, in the coming slides. Highly active individuals and athletes, we're looking at a, a seven to eight and a quarter hour minimum. You may want to sleep a little bit more, you may want to even incorporate, you know, some naps to facilitate recovery or just to feel sharp. And we're not talking about a two hour, you know, nap midday or siesta. We're talking about a 15 minute, quote, cat nap or power nap, um, you know, that can definitely be beneficial. Um, you know, and, and something that a lot of athletes, you know, have sworn by, you know, throughout their careers. So I got so one there for you, Joe. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, Happy, Joe. Yeah, from Darnell again. It's um, what are your thoughts on the use of binaural sounds, music such as sophageo, uh frequencies, you know, 528, 285, 174, to assist in promoting deep regenerative quality type of sleep? I don't know. That's a great question. Um, you know, when we look at different, you know, noises, we look at sound machines, we look at different apps, um, you know, and there's, you know, noises uh, that are emitted at different, you know, frequencies, you know, such as, you know, white noise or pink noise or brown noise, all of these different noises, looking at brown, no brown noise specifically, because um, there's been a little bit of research on that, that could actually, um, you know, cause you know fluctuations in brain waves that are be more conducive to getting into deeper sleep and also staying in that deeper state of sleep so they're really kind of to be viewed as um you know prophylactic aid to help you you know get to sleep and also stay asleep um and then help drown out some environmental um you know ambient noise so you know my recommendation um, you know, would be, you know, if you are having, you know, some sleep latency issues, because not everyone could just go ahead and, you know, shut the TV off or, you know, just, you know, 
pull down the covers and go to bed. It's not that easy, but if you need uh, something else to kind of unwind and transition, I would highly recommend a sound machine. Uh, you could also even, you know, look at, um, you know, a HEPA filter, if you have maybe a clock radio and putting it on, you know, um, you know, a decommissioned AM station, um, you know, so the frequency, the noise can be, you know, closer to maybe white noise at that point. Uh, that's something that would be, you know, recommended. But again, whether it's to, uh, you know, promote relaxation, uh, whether it's to help you get in deeper states of sleep, um, you know, it's it's been shown as, you know, being beneficial or, or you know, at the very least showing promise in both of those areas. Cool. Yeah, I've actually got one uh, came in earlier a little bit, but it, it applies now, I think. <clears throat> is, uh, where did it go? Oh, uh, <laughs> she was wondering if uh, in regards to sleep apnea, positional mm -hmm. sleep apnea uh, will be discussed. Uh, Catherine was wondering. Well, that, that's... Okay, Catherine, that's a great question. One of the things that we can, you know, talk about, you know, sleep apnea is, you know, sleep apnea is really, um, you know, the result of, uh, you know, airway obstruction, and it could be due to, you know, position. It could also be due to, um, you know, physiological cross-sectional error, specifically of, um, you know, the neck area. Um, you know, it could also, you know, be exacerbated by, you know, some pulmonary conditions too. So one of the things, you know, as it relates to, you know, sleep apnea, um, you know, if someone has a larger neck circumference, probably not the best idea to sleep in a supine position or completely flat position, although I would still check with your position here, because that will cause relaxation of some of the neck musculature, and that will, you know, bear down on the airway, and that'll make sleeping a little more challenging. Um, you know, there's been, you know, promise, and, and there have been um, you know, a lot of, you know, studies that have demonstrated the success of, um, you know, the sleep gym and also CPAP machines, um, you know, because they are going to help, um, you know, promote, you know, oxygen delivery, particularly to the brain during, you know, deeper, um, you know, stages of sleep. Um, but certainly position can impact, um, you know, your sleep quality. And if you do, if you are a person that has maybe a larger neck or you have some pulmonary conditions, um, you know, um, you know, that, that's something that's, you know, worth checking into. Oh, great question, Catherine. Oh, cool. Yeah, we, um, one was asking, how do you know if you're a short sleeper? Tammy was. Tammy, if, <laughs> well, you can do genetic testing, but, um, uh, you know, really the, the most practical thing is, you know, Tammy, assess how many hours a night that you're sleeping um you know and if if you're able to establish an average and you you feel as though that you're functioning at a high level and everyone else you know hasn't noticed any kind of aberration in your day-to-day -day activities or functions you know you're not drifting off you know you're not catatonic um you're able to function at a high level the chances are you may be a short sleeper maybe not to the extremes that you know or presidents were or Tom Ford or like Kobe Bryant was, but you know, you could potentially get away with fewer hours of sleep than the most, most of the population is denoted on the slide. Great, 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 great. I um one other one that we have here is uh, sure. uh what what do you think about sleep apps that tell you how you slept? Um, her 26 year old swears by his this is for mary you know I, I i think that you know that i would i would really you know question you know the validity of a lot of those you know applications um uh, you know and and different you know wearables um you know it's probably you know best in, in my opinion to go the old-fashioned way just get you know a sleep study done um, but one thing that they're able to discern, you know, from a lot of those wearables and, and different apps is, um, you, know, you know, you're looking at, you know, heart rate, you're looking at respiration. And then from there, they're able to, you know, establish, you know, and also your activity level too. You're not really active during sleep as you would be if you were awake, um, unless you work for the DMV. But, uh, you know, I digress. So it just really kind of taking those metrics and it's, in a way, kind of assuming what stage of sleep you're in or, you know, your sleep quality. So, um, you know, I, I think that the sleep, the getting a sleep study, getting an EEG study, um, you know, with maybe a pulse oximeter is probably going to be the gold standard versus, you know, one of those apps. 
uh, but those apps certainly are helpful. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Sure thing. Yeah, the app should be viewed more or less as a compass versus in you know, the mode of transportation. So that the, the apps will tell you, hey, you know, what this is, you know, the right direction. You're able to establish, you know, trends. You're able to establish maybe some correlation that you can go ahead and and uh, you know have a discussion with, you know, your primary care provider or perhaps another specialist. Cool. Good, Joe. Yeah. So we'll continue on just to improve sleep quality. A lot of this is rather common sense here. So we're improving sleep quality. And again, we could also improve sleep um, you know, duration, but we wanna make sure that we establish a consistent bedtime, wake time, and sleep duration. And we could do that uh, within shorter increments. And these increments could be 15 to 30 minutes, uh, which are recommended for anyone that is traveling across time zones or trans meridian travelers. Um, and then also individuals that might be traveling or they may have to adjust their schedule for instance i work with a number of uh division one and also professional basketball players this is prior to them you know going to their respective you know teams or colleges many of whom were on the west coast at the time so we would practice and we would train um you know a little bit later in the day to replicate um you know doing that on the west coast even though we were on the east coast at the time so again we could adjust our activities also we anticipate travel um, we want to, you know, increase or manipulate, you know, our sleep duration by 15 to 30 minutes. So it's like, Hey, I'm going to start sleeping eight hours a night, but I only slept four the night before shoot for, you know, four hours and 15 minutes, um, you know, that, that next day, or maybe for that entire week, because that's still, you know, an improvement and trending in the right direction, refraining from consuming large meals, um, and sugary foods. We have gone over the reasons why avoiding exposure to fluorescent lights. Uh, LEDs and blue light prior to bedtime and avoiding exposure to bright light two to three hours prior to bedtime. My recommendation, you know, you could go ahead, you could put, um, you know, a dimming uh, protective, you know, cover on your screen, on your laptop or your phone. You could also even use, uh, you know, different apps, dimming apps. Um, you could even wear, you know, uh, glasses too, where the lenses are going to be a little dimmed. Um, so that way, you know, you're not taking in all of that, you know, bright light, particularly that blue light before bed, eliminating all electronic devices from the bedroom or sleep environment, say for maybe a fan, a HEPA filter, or maybe, uh, you know, running your phone on airplane mode, um, you know, unless you're a physician on call, um, you know, or like a resident advisor, you know, at a, at a, you know, dormitory in college, shut that off, go airplane mode just operate, you know, your, your, your sleep app, if you will, or maybe even run something on YouTube. They have a lot of commercial free YouTube videos that can be streamed. Uh, just make sure you shut off your notifications and you can run that all night, phone down or dim the screen. You'll be fine. Also, we want to consider the climate of the sleep microenvironment. So we want to take into account, you know, uh, what is the temperature? Ideally temperatures between 60 and 68 degrees. Um, you know, and humidity, uh, relative humidity between 40 and 60% are going to be optimal for sleeping. Um, you know, just because your body temperature drops, it's going to be a little more helpful too. And, and of course, you know, comfortable clothing uh, that's going to be breathable or maybe even warm if it's the winter and, you know, it might be a little bit cooler, maybe in the low 50s in your room. Um, all of these are going to be conducive as well as bedding uh, to improving, you know, your sleep quality. So you should really look forward to sleep rather than dreading it because, hey, you might have a pillow, you might have, you know, memory foam, um, you know, cover or, you know, mattress. So all of these things, you know, really should be considered, especially when you want to improve sleep quality. Uh, what I will do is, um, you know, I will take some questions, you know, for the, uh, the balance, um, you know, the, the hour. I think we only have about two minutes remaining, Jay. Uh, but if we can't get around to any uh, questions, or I can't get around to, you know, any answers, feel free to email me directly at josephgiandonato at gmail.com if you want to screenshot that, um, or even go ahead, I'll put it up in the chat. He'll re reach out. You can take probably two more questions before we conclude today. I, yeah, I've got one here. I'm trying to look for a, a short one. <laughs> Let's see. Um, I've been on CPAP 20 plus years and still don't think my sleep quality is the best for slow wave sleep, even though my apneas are well controlled. Um, but, uh, but, 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 uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I lost a spot there, it's a long one. My last sleep study wasn't representative 
uh, night for me and showed I did not reach REM sleep, which I normally do. Wondering about the effectiveness of the Aura ring. I know that my Fitbit is not very accurate and normally try to avoid wearing it. Yeah, Actually, I, yeah. Yeah, I, thank you for your question. I might have, I might not be the most qualified person to, you know, answer the, the first part of the question, um, you know, as it pertains to, you know, uh, you know, managing sleep apnea. Uh, that's probably something I would check in, you know, with your, uh, you know, primary care provider or specialist. Um, but, you know, the recommendations, you know, um, would be, you know, again, maybe getting another, you know, sleep study or two. So that way, um, you know, just having a single sleep study, you know, some of those results may be, you know, inconclusive. Um, you know, the, the only way that you're really going to know that you went into REM sleep is, you know, if, um, you know, you have an EEG along with the sleep study, um, you know, and then practically, you know, you know, if you're looking at, you know, some of those metrics from one of those apps, um, you know, from, I really don't, I really don't like Fitbit for the purposes of, you know, uh, monitoring sleep, you know, may, maybe it could be, you know, the R ring, um, you know, looking at one of those, you know, devices and you're able to kind of extrapolate some sort of a trend from that triangulation of, you know, your resting heart rate from your, um, you know, from your respiration rate, you know, from your activity level, um, you know, you're able to look at all of those things. But I would, I probably, you know, would look at maybe getting another, you know, sleep study or two done. So that way you're able to ascertain, okay, how much of my sleep is REM sleep based upon, you know, the, you know, the brain waves that are being measured by the EEG. Um, but also I would, you know, consider, you know, if you have, you know, sleep apnea, you know, is it a structural issue? Is it maybe an issue that could be, um, you know, is it it's something that could maybe be, you know, fixed from a standpoint of, um, you know, a lifestyle, all of these things, you know, should definitely be, you know, looked at, but I would say as it relates to managing that, you know, definitely check in with a medical professional. No, that's that's good sound advice. A lot of these questions I'm seeing here really <clears throat> would be uh, uh, supposition by Joe to try to apply some of those principles across the, a broad spectrum of questions here. I that sleep study is the way to go if you're having these kind of, or your clients are having these kind of issues, and of course getting that feedback so you can be even more effective with what you're doing from your end as far as. Uh, nutrition exercise and, and and coaching them up i i can share that also from my big mistake is that uh because i i like the listening at night to rain and that kind of stuff it helps me really get down into a deep sleep and so on um but be aware of if you use the youtube version of it and you don't have that uh, uh <laughs> Your phone may uh, start running up gigabytes of because they run that stuff through there yep. in many situations. The next thing you know, your gigabytes are up way above your plan, and the next thing you know, you've got a four or five hundred dollar bill. So uh, be aware of how you utilize that and how you you're not roaming. <laughs> yeah, have, have an unlimited data plan. Have a stable Wi-Fi, uh, you know, signal. That's um, right. But and and also you know if you are going to stream something on youtube make sure it's going to be the commercial free version otherwise you're going to be jostled out of bed with some advertisement you know at two in the morning so <laughs> yeah um but uh, you know again you know kidding aside you know jay provided some you know uh, good recommendations to to kind of you know uh piggyback on you know what we've discussed uh you know in today's webinar so again if anyone has any additional questions which can't be covered because we have a finite amount of time I want to make sure we have ample time to finish our days and get you know uh sufficient sleep uh feel free to reach it out to me directly um you know there's my email address it's also the chat go ahead screenshot copy and paste it uh definitely want to you know extend my appreciation to jay for his um you know support and for the continued opportunities um you know to to really you know uh connect with uh to you know inspire to empower you know uh, some like-minded colleagues um you know who, who are you know hell bent on improving which um you know it's it's really really awesome you know can't put that into words and definitely want to extend my appreciation to y'all for uh you know being committed professionals um you know and, and really honing your craft and uh ultimately you know you're going to be impacting the lives of many and, and improving them hopefully today was just you know part of that journey so looking forward to feeling any questions you have and certainly connecting with you all in the near future Beautiful. Thanks, Joe. And uh, uh, thanks, everybody, for attending and expect that in six hours. And 
some great comments here at the end about clean tube, uh, which has no commercials uh, on these kind of things. But um, hopefully um, we'll stay engaged, right? And uh, reach out to Joe or myself and we'll uh, get you what we know. Thanks Take again. And, and six, out, six hours, you should be ready. So don't stay past your bedtime if you're on the East Coast. All right. I'll see <laughs> y'all. Have right. a great day. Take care. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Bye. Joe. Bye.